platforming games, racing games, fighting games, adventure games, horror games, shooting games, puzzle games, and even sports games. We used to have it so cool. So, what went wrong? I have wanted to make this video for quite some time now. Why are older games better? That's what we are going to talk about in this video. Sit tight and grab a cup of coffee, tea or whatever you prefer because this is going to be a long one. Before we get to my points and reasoning for why I'm saying this, I need to tell you where I'm coming from regarding the gaming landscape. Especially because younger audiences lack the perspective of a gamer who has seen it all growing up unless they have researched it. But even then they don't have personal experience with how gaming was back then and how it is now. So, I was around when games looked like this. The first gaming system we had at home was Commodore 64 computer with a cassette deck, no less. That's what our parents got us when we wanted the Nintendo Entertainment System, but they found this guy who was selling his C64 and it was much cheaper than the NES. When we were picking it up, the guy who was selling it asked me what kind of games I liked and I mumbled something out of my mouth like Super Mario Brothers? And he was like, okay, and loaded up Gianna Sisters from one of his multi-game cassettes. And I thought, okay, if it's this or nothing, I'll take this. Of course, we could never load that Gianna Sisters game anymore, because none of us in our family really knew how to use the damn thing. But mainly, because most of the stuff we got was very legal copies, with multiple games on a single cassette, meaning you had to be pretty precise with the tape deck to load what you wanted. The good thing about that was we discovered lots of games like The Amazing International Karate Plus, one of the first fighting games I ever played. The first one would be the very similar The Way of the Exploding Fist. was actually one of those few legit games we got with it. So it was easy to load from the cassette because that was the first and only thing on it. So we had some fun with it but we finally got what we really wanted on Christmas that same year. The shiny new Nintendo Entertainment System or NES for short. So I've been playing games on both consoles and on home computers or PC if you prefer for the longest time and I like both experiences for different reasons. And when it was time for 16-bit action, again we had both a home computer and a console. Both had 68,000 heart on fire. Of course I'm talking about Commodore Amiga 500 and Sega Mega Drive or Genesis depending on where you are from. A few years later, the console market started to oversaturate with subpar systems from many manufacturers like 3DO companies, 3DO Multimedia Player, Philips CDI and Atari Jaguar. I read about them from gaming magazines of the time and wanted them all because they all looked fine on screenshots. After the fact, I'm happy I didn't get any of them because the good ones were only coming in the next 2 to 3 years. Of course, I'm talking about probably my favorite generation of console gaming, the Sega Saturn, Sony Playstation and Nintendo 64. I never had a Sega Saturn but I really wanted one and actually still want one, someday, someday. But I sure had Playstation under my TV for Christmas 1996 and N64 at some point in 1997. A few months after it came out here in Europe. Yeah, it was March 1997 when it was released in Europe. Both of these systems blew my mind so hard, especially Super Mario 64 when I first time saw it playing on some local video game TV show for a preview of upcoming stuff. I knew I had to have it. A few months later, 
I did. Nothing had been so mind blowing when it comes to video games before that and since then. Generational leaps like that just don't happen anymore. Look at some PS4 and PS5 games for example. You have to take out your magnifying glass digital foundry style to start picking up differences. Sure, the trained eye can spot some of them without zooming in 800%, but I digress. So, why knowing this backstory is important? That's because it gives the context for my opinions of what I'm going to say in this video. Now you know how and when my gaming life started and how I grew up and lived through what I call the golden era of gaming, the PS2 generation, before the DLC, microtransactions, cookie cutter cookie based Ubisoft style open world games, day one patches and overly political correctness. Let's talk about those generational leaps first, because I already touched the topic a little bit. As I mentioned earlier, Super Mario 64 blew my mind when I first time saw it on television. Even though I would have played 3D games on PlayStation before it, like Jumping Flash, which is also a very impressive generational leap coming from 16-bit 2D games. If you came from Super Nintendo Entertainment System to Nintendo 64, where games used to look like this to games that look like this instead the jump was humongous <music> 2D games were all we knew before the fifth generation of video game consoles sure there were some rough 3D things on PCs and even on Mega Drive and Amiga but they were Usually very low polygon counts, no texture mapping and very low frame rates at the time when most console games ran 60 frames per second or fields per second. Then suddenly I'm witnessing this new Mario game with a truly realized 3D world and smooth 30 FPS gameplay, texture mapping and texture filtering. Nowadays I prefer the PlayStation look for that era of 3D games with sharp pixels, but texture filtering was a thing back then and was appreciated. The game was more advanced if it had it, 3D accelerated PC games had it and it was preferable to software rendering, not alone for texture filtering but for higher frame rates, resolution and additional effects. Going for the new millennia and new consoles, Dreamcast, PS2, Xbox and Gamecube showed us another huge leap in visuals and graphical fidelity. You could tell when you saw a PS2 game that it was a tremendous leap from the original PlayStation, no matter what game or genre of games it was. The last time I felt we had such a leap in visuals was the move from PS2 generation to PS3. Now we had fully programmable shaders and the jump to high definition. But I don't remember feeling anything at all when I first time booted a PS4 game. It just looked like a PC version of a PS3 game to me. Higher resolution, better anti-aliasing and higher frame rates. We are now experiencing diminishing returns in graphical fidelity from generation to generation. This is only natural as the more advanced graphics get, but still it added to the feeling of playing something really new and we don't have that anymore. Really the most impressive thing about this current generation to me was the Matrix Unreal Engine 5 demo on PS5. And even that isn't such a huge leap as we used to have back in the day. Generational leaves weren't always just about graphics either. Systems using 10 futuristic CD-ROM technology introduced us to games with CD-quality music. Even though I really appreciate chiptunes today, back then it was amazing to have real music instead of beeps and boops. Also, I remember when I first time used that analog stick on that N64 pad to control Mario on the screen, it was a revolutionary feeling. 
Shortly after Sony introduced their dual analog controller for the PlayStation, I knew I had to have it. Yes, analog controller before DualShock. I have never actually owned DualShock for the original PlayStation, and I think this is still the best feeling controller ever made. I prefer non-rubberized concave sticks and bigger and better shaped handles than the ones on the DualShock. I still think the best analog stick was on the N64 controller though, well, before it had worn down to the point of failure. It was amazing when it was in flawless condition, but clearly flawed design that broke down rather quickly for most people. It just felt different compared to any other analog stick on a controller ever since. If you haven't experienced it, you don't know what I'm talking about. At least DualSense or DualShock 5 as I like to call it, has something new and exciting going for it with haptic feedback and adapted triggers. But still I don't think it's such a game changing thing as the first analog sticks on controllers were. Maybe virtual reality motion controllers can offer something truly new and groundbreaking. I had HTC 5 for some time and I think it was a neat trick for a while, but I don't think that's how I want to play most of my video games. I ended up selling the thing when it was untouched in my closet for 3 months. The next thing on my list of why old games were better is the fact that when you bought the game before the always connected era, you knew you'd get a full and working product. The game was on the disc or the cartridge, ready to go and playable from start to finish without the need for any updates at any point, or even online connectivity which slows down game menus for example because they sent telemetry to the publisher about everything you do in the game. For example, before I connected Tekken Tag Tournament 2 online the menus and loading were way faster. What a mistake. I'm not saying that game breaking bugs didn't exist at all. But at the time they were way less common because these developers and publishers knew they were impossible to fix after the fact. And some games received newer revisions on later prints to fix some issues. A fine example is Gran Turismo 2 on PlayStation where some races had rivals impossible or at least close to impossible to beat because the game had a bug that allowed the computer to enter with a higher class vehicle than intended. This was corrected on later runs of the game. So, one could argue that updates are good. Well, yes. If it didn't lead up to releasing games mainly broken on launch with release it and fix it later mentality. Some games never get truly fixed. Also, if I'm not mistaken, Sony has a policy in place where the game is required to be on the disc playable from start to finish. If it releases physically that is. But apparently, this is not enforced by Sony very much, because there are a few examples having minimal data on the disk, and the rest is downloaded from the internet. So, back to my point that back then you knew the game was fully on the disk when you bought it, and it will work as long as your device reads the disk. No servers are needed for acquiring patches and game data needed to play the game. One could say you had literal ownership of the game. Not to be confused with intellectual property or IP of the copyright holder, but the ownership of your copy of the software. You could lend it to the friend, you could sell it, give it to somebody, or keep it forever. No online checks and DRM schemes to verify your right to play. Your right to play was guaranteed by having the disc, cartridge, diskette, or even cassette in your hands. Sure, there were convoluted DRM schemes on PC games back then too, but this wasn't an issue with console gaming really. Now I have PS4 games on my shelf that say Ultimate Edition on the box, but when you open the box, the disc inside is just for the base game and additional content was given to me as redeemable codes. In other words, the physical copy of the game really isn't the ultimate edition, isn't it? If I was to sell this game now, when I have used the codes for the additional content, should I sell it as the base game 
that it really is for the buyer at that point or just say ultimate edition and the codes might have been used. I'm pretty sure the buyer will be too happy about it. Then there is the collector's problem. A buyer who wants the base game wouldn't want this box and the buyer who wants the ultimate edition wouldn't get it. This game is literally unsellable and that's by design I think. These companies have always wanted to kill the used game market. I don't have issues like that if I wanted to sell any of my PS2 games for example. True ownership all of the content it came with. Of course we have the exact same issues as a buyer. I can confidently go and buy a PS2 game or even PS3 game knowing that the whole game is on the disc playable from start to finish. On PS3 there might be some updates but nothing on the magnitude of modern games. And maybe some games had online passes you would need to buy if you wanted to play them online. But that really isn't a concern for games whose servers and online support are long gone anyway at this point. And when I say the whole game is on the disc, I also mean no DLC or downloadable content as it was known during that era when primary distribution was still a physical product. That leads up to my next point. The dawn of the DLC was on Xbox during the 6th generation of consoles, but it wasn't really a problem yet. It was truly used to enhance the games you enjoyed playing the most. Nothing was chopped away from the games before the release to sell you separately or upfront as a more expensive edition of the game. Sure there were expansions for some games, especially on PC already at that time, but even then they were huge packs that expanded almost all aspects of the game and you really got your money's worth when you bought them and they weren't chopped away from you if you didn't buy the more expensive game. I'd be naive to think they didn't plan some of these expansions beforehand but still it wasn't the PS tasting thing like these days. The DLC isn't even most of our worries these days when buying a game. On top of whatever a modern AAA game costs in your region, modern games have the audacity to ask for more of your hard earned money when you just bought it. I'm sick and tired of hearing that it's just optional cosmetics things etc etc. No it's not. For example in some Ubisoft games they literally sell you a time saver ultimately admitting the game is not properly balanced without this optional thing you can buy for more money. And even if it was only cosmetics, I actually miss the days when additional costumes or characters, among other things, were unlocked by playing the game. We get to my next point from here, the cheat codes. Yeah, back in the day we used to have cheat codes in games, to make them easier, harder or other things to have more fun. But now in the era of microtransactions and in-game purchases, seeds have to be bought for more money. A fine example of this was in NHL games where you basically were required to have this golden stick thing to be competitive. I'd say that Ubisoft Time Saver is fun form of cheat as well because you gain more experience points than the players who don't want to waste money on that. I'm not saying everybody should cheat in video games, especially online games. It should be zero tolerance, but I mainly talk about single player games here. But back then, if you really wanted to cheat, it was free. And last but not least, when you were mostly done with the game, it was time to have fun with game breaking cheats. Even if you thought games were too hard or not, so you wanted to utilize the cheat codes, leads us to my next reason why old games were better. Next thing I think old games did better than the new ones is that they didn't think the player was brain dead. Sure, there were some cryptic and confusing things because of mistranslations and even because of poor game design, but mainly games were challenging but still fair, especially during the 5th and 6th generation of consoles, which would be the original PlayStation Saturn and N64 to Dreamcast, PS2, Xbox and GameCube. 
There weren't obvious go here markers in games like Final Fantasy VII, for example. It put you on this huge map and lets you go to do your thing as a player. Yeah, sure you could waste your time and wander around aimlessly before going in the right direction and get clues from the people who lived in those places. You actually needed to listen, or in this case read, and pay attention, because this was the direction you were given and then you had to think a little and go from there. Games didn't think you were stupid, they were designed in a way that they counted on your ability to figure it out. And if you didn't, they happily sold you the official strategy guide. I kinda miss those too. Lots of times you didn't even need to buy them separately if you read the gaming magazines because they included them regularly. And if you still needed more help, there were those cheats for free. All you needed is to acquire them from somewhere. And yes, usually every single issue of those gaming magazines had them too. Another thing I didn't even plan to include in this video. Even video game journalism was so much better than these days. We all know video game journalists are a joke today. They talked about games, and only games, not politics, and their goal was to help and provide information to players. I can understand if younger people especially would think that all the games were hard and punishing because sometimes they really were, but I'd argue as well that they were also way more rewarding when you eventually overcame the challenge or figured out something instead of an arrow pointing you to the next thing you needed to go, or some brat yelling you the solution to the puzzle before you even had the time to give any thought to how to solve it. And then there were way more genres in gaming back then because there weren't real standards on how to do things yet. Especially when we moved from 2D to 3D. Sir, some of those designs were bad, really bad. But what I'm trying to say is that when there was more experimentation, we had more the diversity in how the games were played. Meaning that if you finished game A and started to play game B, even if it was somewhat the same genre, it probably played very differently. And we get to my next point from here. So, we had way more varied game designs and genres of the games back then. Partly because real working standards weren't figured out by developers yet. You could argue, of course, that it's better now, because we have those standards, for example for third person shooters. Yeah, sir, I agree with you, to some extent, but it also creates a problem for me. Every single third person shooter game feels like it's exactly the same game to me, just different window dressing. Add to that, a typical cookie cutter empty soulless open world of today, and we have a cookie cutter modern third person shooter open world game in our hands, we have played through too many times at this point. It's just not enough anymore that a story changes, theme, graphics, characters, whatever it is, to differentiate these things. At least it's not enough for me anymore to keep my interest. Especially because stories, the content and character designs, especially female designs, have to be overly politically correct these days. I have zero interest in them anyway. I have to mention the Ubisoft formula and how tiring it is at this point. How many times you have played the same game that basically started somewhere like Far Cry 3 or something, or the original Assassin's Creed? Discover a huge empty map, liberate some outposts from enemies, climb a tower and reveal more of them. Rinse and repeat 50 times. I'm sick and tired of that formula in 2023. It should go away and preferably never come back. If you want to make an open world game in 2023, it really has to have something else going on for it than this copy paste Ubisoft formula. The open world used to be my favorite video game genre, for example my all time favorite game Super Mario 64 kinda had an open world, 
and it was my first experience with such open-ended gameplay and I loved it. Sure, probably some of it was because it was so new at the time. Of course, Mario 64's world is very segmented and small by today's standards, but it was impressive back then on N64 of all things. And last but not least, I have to mention the death of B games or AA games or whatever you want to call them as long as you don't call them middleware because that's a completely different thing and out of the scope of this video but for example Havoc Physics and Speed 3 are middleware technologies to speed up game development. So for simplicity's sake I call them B game in this video. Nowadays we mainly have two categories of games, or at least two that'll get the most media attention. The AAA games like Marvel Spider-Man, Call of Duty, etc. And then we have indie or independently produced games that are completely opposite of the production value and budget of the AAA stuff. But we used to have plenty of games that landed somewhere in the middle. The B games. Couple examples of B game would be something like Wet for the PS3 and Xbox 360, published by everybody's favorite Bethesda Softworks and developed by Artificial Mind and Movement, today known as Behavior Interactive. And here you can see this game's middleware solutions. So the game is not middleware, it's a B game or A or double A, but I promise to call them B games to not to make it more confusing. Another example is Yakuza Fury on PS2 and it's a 3D beat'em up of all things. Those were extinct pretty much at this point already and I was very sad about it because it was one of my favorite genres of games. This one is published by 505 Game Street or now just 505 Games and developed by Winged Un Systems. Even sounds like a B game developer. Yeah, I never heard of that before researching it for this video. So, this type of game will last between then and now. Sure, there are some games, especially in the JRPG genre that would fall in this category or games like Nier Automata. But they aren't as nearly as common as they used to be. And the reason I love this game so much, because they kinda look like games that belong on the system they were designed for, but of course couldn't match AAA production quality. That didn't mean they weren't fun games. Actually, more often than not, they were more fun than many AAA productions that started already to fall into the trap of cookie cutter standardized molds. And no, indie games aren't a replacement for them. Most indie games just aren't interesting enough and most importantly don't look the part. What independent game today comes even close to matching AAA production values of today? There can be hidden gems. Oh damn, I love that term. There can be hidden gems in the vast sea of software quality indie games, but it doesn't mean that they aren't mostly garbage. Just like software games were back in the day that was made for best selling systems just for the fast gas crap. And there it is, my reasons why old games were better than the new stuff we have today. Of course, there are some other issues with modern gaming like the fact that lots of AAA games are more interactive movies than actual video games these days. But I leave it here for now. If you want to see something else I made, click on the video on your screen now. Thanks for watching, bye for now.